Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Brother Garfield podcast. Today, I have a special guest. She goes by the name of Dr. Maggie Bryce, and she's an Egyptologist, well qualified in her field. I'm allow her to introduce herself. Um, how are you doing today, Dr. Maggie Bryson? How are you doing today? I'm doing okay, Garfield. It's nice to talk to you. All right. So before we, we start the interview, can you give us an idea of your background as far as education and what you're currently working on? Sure. So I have a PhD in Egyptology from Johns Hopkins University. <clears throat> um, I specialized in the art um, of the New Kingdom period. So um, the, the time of Egypt's you know, great empire, the era of Tutankhamun, if you will. Um, I also, you know, the program at Hopkins is interdisciplinary. So we do, um, we have a lot of crossover with our colleagues in Mesopotamia, um, the Levant, and so I was lucky enough to actually get a fair bit of exposure um, to those areas um, and also to have some training in Egyptian language, which I think is, is a really neat feature of the kind of education that, that my colleagues and I had on coming up through Hopkins. So we, you know, got a pretty broad overview, you know, broad view of, of a lot of issues and topics in ancient Near Eastern culture. Um, and these days I, um, I teach part time. I, um, I'm, you know, my research is still pretty much what it was. I'm really interested in, in the sort of stylistic analysis of Egyptian art, um, and I'm also interested in the historiography of ancient Egypt. So, how do we, how, how did we get the ideas about ancient Egypt that we have now? You know, what have scholars been writing about, talking about, thinking about um, in our sort of modern day and age writ large? So, since the scientific study of the ancient world started, um, you know, in the Enlightenment period. And I say scientific, I use the word scientific loosely, right? So the, the study of the ancient world as we think of it today, right, sort of the application of the critical um, viewpoint, right, the, the, the critical techniques and, and thought processes that we use, right? So that sort of largely is born out of the Enlightenment milieu and the early modern <laughs> world. And so I'm, I'm really interested in how we get the ideas that we have today about ancient Egypt and how those ideas change and evolve on an ongoing basis. All righty. Let me add my co-host for the, this this interview here. This is our brother Unk. How are you doing, brother Unk? How are you doing today? How you doing, Garfield? How you doing, Dr. Maggie? How you feeling? Nice to meet you. How are you? Hey, nice uh, to meet you. Um, This is, um. let me introduce y'all officially. This is Dr. Maggie Bryson. All right. She's a uh, she, of course, she's a doctor, she's an Egyptologist, and um, she was just going into how her background and so forth. But Dr. Maggie, let me ask you this. Um, what made you want to get into Egyptology? Let's rewind 20, 30 years. I mean, <laughs> what made you want to get into this type of stuff? I think, you know, probably the same thing that, that pulls almost everybody to it. I think, you know, I remember being in a library when I was about not seven or eight years old, and I saw a book, and there were all these, you know, men in, in white tunics on the front moving giant stones, and I thought, that's amazing. I can't believe people could do that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I opened the book, and and, and there's something about the aesthetic, about, <clears throat> you know, the, the sort of imagery that just pulls you, and I'm not even sure why, um, but it just, it fascinated me. It always has. Oh, okay. All right, so moving on. What projects are you currently working on in the field of study that you're in? Are you are you teaching? Are you working on projects? Are you traveling abroad? What are you working on currently? Not much, to be honest. I teach, um, you know, just part time, and and you know, I kind of moved away from the academic professional world. You know, I when I graduated, I spent some time on the job market and didn't find anything permanent, and and got pregnant with my son. <laughs> you know, figured, oh, I think I'm going to, I'm going to take a back seat for a while. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, I, I still have an interest obviously in the subject and I still read and try to stay current um, writing, you know, I'm writing an article now about a, um, a, a sort of Greco-Roman memory of one of the, of the King that I, I wrote my dissertation on. So, you know, just, just kind of things like that. Um, and I've actually been interested in, in, you know, this late, this Greco-Roman memory of ancient Egypt. Okay. So, okay. All right. Um, so 
you're, you wrote about, a, your dissertation was about a king. What's the name of the king that you um, wrote the dissertation about? Harmheb. Joseph Kepper said to Fenway Harmheb. Okay. I was checking it out on academia.edu. You're pretty, you're a very nice writer, I should say. You're a very nice writer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you got, good, you got good skills. I was checking it out. All right. <laughs> I've seen you on a couple of, couple of um, YouTube videos, of course, with um, Digital Hammurabi and, of course, with my buddy Derek at Myth Vision. Um, do you teach? I saw a video where you said learn Middle Egyptian with Dr. Maggie Bryson. What was well? Do you still do that, or what do you what do you, what do you do as far as YouTube is concerned? Honestly, I haven't done much. You know, I um, you know, I just it's something I, I usually come on YouTube when somebody I I like has a question for me, <laughs> you know, or somebody I respect, or you know, somebody a friend of mine. Like um, you mentioned, Digital Hammer Rabbi, you know, or our mutual friend, Dr. Josh, um, right. is the one who introduced me to you. And, you know, if he thinks you're somebody that it's worth talking to, then, you know, I'm, so I'm here to talk to you. If, if there's anything I can offer you in terms of my knowledge that'll help you in, in your community, then right, right, right. I'm here for it. So, Brother Onk, you got a question for Dr. Maggie Bryson? Uh, how you doing, Dr. Maggie? Uh, so... As far as the, the, the state formation, and I, I know early on the Egyptologists, uh, they kept it like in this Near Eastern context, and they was uh, afraid to put it in this African context. So uh, these days, where's the field uh, viewing uh, the Nile Valley cultures? I think these days, most people I know are tr try to look at it for itself. <clears throat> they try to recognize the cultures of the ancient Nile Valley as, you know, in, you know, cultures that formed in that region independently, but also in contact with that international media. So everything, right, they, you know, the, the moment at which we can start to see the culture of the Nile Valley, the moment at which we can, you know, the writing develops, the moment in which, you know, monumental architecture develops is a moment where there's already contact with the Levant and even further afield. So I think the effort is to understand the development of these Nile Valley cultures as sort of unique, um, situated in their geographic context, but also interacting with people from, you know, farther afield, interacting with ideas that were developing, you know, emerging, um, sort of in the Fertile Crescent, for example. Um, because it's it's really hard to start teasing out all those strands, and all you can do is kind of look at where what the evidence you have enables you to say. Does, does that help? Is that what you're looking for? Or? Um, well, I, I know early on in, in early on in Egyptologists, it was the focus was uh, in the beginning there was a population that invaded came into Africa, so. Uh, I know they've gotten away from that. They, they, they yes, through that concept. So I was just wondering, like, and your understanding, how far as the field came from that perspective? It's come a long way, thank heaven. I think um, 19th century Egyptologists, the, the sort of 19th century world, right? And this is the famous sort of, you know, Flinders Petrie and his idea that there was some kind of pharaonic civilization that the continent of Africa could never have produced something as remarkable as ancient Egyptian civilization. So it must've been seeded from outside. And I think no one today would give any credence to that idea that that the, the pharaonic civilization, right? The, the Egyptian world as we know it um, with its monumental architecture, with its language, written language, with its art, um, engineering, medicine, there was a complete unwillingness in the 19th century among a lot of people to imagine that the African continent could have produced that. Much less that that civilization could then have been looked to as an example by the Greco-Roman civilization that they held to be their great sort of foundational civilization. And I don't think that anyone in the field of Egyptology now would say that, would, would sort of give it the time of day. I think a lot of Egyptologists are a little embarrassed in some ways to remember that, that that's where, you know, sort of the roots of our field lie. And it's true that the very earliest 
period in Egyptian history for which we have, <clears throat> you know, a lot of strong um, evidence, right? So uh, in terms of like, so the beginning of history, right? History is when you can start writing about it. History is when you have um, a written language. And so they, the, the written language of Egypt emerged in a period in which there's already a lot of contact between Egypt and the Levant more broadly. Right, so we have people, you know, imported goods from, you know, like lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, even, right? So, you know, people are traveling over great distances, and there are motifs that we see in Mesopotamian art in the period that start popping up in Egyptian art, right? So, like the master of animals motif, this strong man holding the the wild animals by the neck, and it's things like that that led Petrie to, to you know, and others sort of thinking in the that along that line, sort of go, oh, hey great, they weren't actually African. <laughs> These were people like us, they belonged to us. They were, they were from, you know, Mesopotamia, from the Levant, from places where people are not as dark and, and so we can claim them, right? They, this, this culture, this civilization has to have been an import. And now I don't think anyone thinks that this idea that there was a wholesale import, that everything that is good and great and wonderful about Egypt came from someplace where people weren't dark. I think that idea is completely, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't think of anybody that would hold to it. <laughs> you know, I mean, Egypt, you know, just as you say, right, the Nile Valley is a place, I and mean, ultimately, right, the Nile Valley is probably the earliest place that we find humans, right, anatomically modern humans right now, as, as far as I know, and again, I'm not an expert in human evolution, but right. I think our earliest anatomically modern humans come from the very southern end of this Nile Valley continuum, geographically speaking. You know, it's in Africa. It had plenty of time to develop indigenously. There's plenty of of human culture, civilization development in the prehistoric period in that region that takes place independently. And there's no reason why what we see with pharaonic civilization can't be the result of that civilization, just like any civilization, right? Interacting with its neighbors as it develops indigenously. You know, I think the the you know, and again, I'm not like I said, my training, my research is all in a much later period in Egyptian history. I, I don't do prehistory and, and state formation as a specialty. Mm. But I, if I understand correctly, if I read correctly the current view, it is that that state formation process is complex, but it emerges from the interaction of people who are there with people traveling from to and from other places, just like any <laughs> civilization develops and builds, right? In a world where people are mobile. Yeah, it's kind of complicated. Three intersecting continents uh, with different populations confluence. So that, that can be very, very uh, murky. But I preach. Mm -hmm. uh, are you also familiar with maybe, well, you said your, your, your expertise is not on like, like the early, early formation. But have you heard of anything uh, dealing with the Green Sahara and that population that may have traveled to the Nile Valley based off of climatic weather changes? Yeah. So the idea is that, you know, in sort of late prehistory, right, the Holocene, the early Holocene, again, correct me if I've got my dates wrong here, okay. you know, because I know that, I, you know, I, I've listened to some of the interviews and, and some of the, the YouTube videos that Garfield has sent me the links to. And it seems like, you know, you're, you guys are, it seems like there's a sort of a tight knit and very well informed group of people who are having this conversation. So I know that you guys have done a lot of reading. Yes. And that you're familiar with a lot of this literature. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but, you know, we're talking about a period, you know, in the, the tens to, you know, multiple tens of thousands of years ago when the northern part of Africa was not as dry as it is now prior to the formation of the Sahara Desert. And so correct. people would have been able to move around a lot more. You can't cross the desert easily. You have to have a lot of preparation there has to be and again people do right the, the Sahara Desert is not a complete barrier to the movement of people no desert is you know human populations have managed to to cross and even inhabit deserts you know using great ingenuity I think but at a time when northern Africa would have been a landscape of grassland with more available water people would have been a lot more mobile you know so people could have been going to and moving from the Nile Valley to other parts of Africa. Um, and so the idea, right, because if I understand correctly, what's at stake in the conversation is whether Egypt is 
fundamentally a civilization that has more links, more sort of connection, more belonging to sub-Saharan sort of Southern and Western Africa, whether it is its own kind of unique thing in the Nile Valley where it's North and East Africa, or whether Egypt belongs with, right? If you had to play a game of sets, right? You're making sets, you would take Egypt and put it, stack it over in the Eurasian geographic milieu in terms of its human population. Is, am I right about that? I, I think for me, what, what I can say what was at stake is, is just understanding it in its proper context, regardless of what the results are. I practice scientific literacy and that's what we teach. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. And then understanding the complete diversity of Africa and African populations. So what's at stake is, is having value and understanding what's really going on. Not how I feel about it, not how I really want it to be. So it's a northeastern population uh, rooted in Africa, just for me, rooted in Africa. And like you said, early on, you had uh, other people coming back and forth and in entering into the indigenous population. And for me, indigenous population does not mean some unmixed, pure population. That's not real. I, I, I read the work like Charles Darwin, this book right here, The Beagle. So I've read this book. And so I understand the ideas. I understand the theories. So for me, what's at stake is just giving the people uh, reality and understanding anthropology, Egyptology, and how they see it using expertise. So that's what's at stake for me, expertise. I would, honestly, I would, I would think that talking to a population geneticist, you know, somebody who's up to date on, on really the most current thinking about what constitutes a population mm. and how early humans moved around the African continent is something that might be interesting for you guys, because it's a really beautiful topic. Like it's really fascinating. If I understand correctly, right, the population genetics of the African continent today and in the distant past reflect a lot of diversity and a lot of movement. Absolutely. And I think it would be strange to me, if the Nile Valley did not have movement to and movement from other parts of Africa, as well as Eurasia. I would be surprised if that were the case, but I'm not a population geneticist. So, you know, in, in the historical period, right? So after writing develops and the Egyptians start telling their own story in writing, in words, an image, right? The art, this representational art that in the Egyptian style, right? In the Egyptian idiom, you know, it seems like there's still a lot of diversity. It seems like there are a lot of different people from a lot of different places that get folded into the Egyptian population. Um, you know, and that's the case today. You know, there's movement of people, like you've got people, you know, God bless them, right? With the, the horrible situation in Gaza, right? There are, you know, millions of people whose immediate ancestry in the last few hundred years is in Palestine, right? In the, you know, Israel-Palestine, in the, the coastal Levant. You have people who have come in from the Sudan, right? Sudan, the nation, or if you think about the region more broadly, right? So, you know, you have Europeans, there are Greek, there, there were you know, Greek enclaves in Northern Egypt, there were, you know, people who've come in from, from the West, from the deserts to the West, so people who are, you know, what you might call Berber ancestry, people who are, you know, South Arabian ancestry, like there's a lot of movement of people. Always has been as far as we can see. Dr. Maggie, one second, for some reason, hold on one second, continue, go ahead. And it's really important to me that I don't, you know, talk out of class. Like, I don't want to say things about population Absolutely. genetics Absolutely. that might mislead people because it's not my, my area of expertise. Yeah, I can tell you how I think of it, right? How I think of Egypt and its population, you know, and that is as, you know, largely its own thing, right? There have been people in the Nile Valley for a very long time. Yes. But a group, but that is an African population to begin with. Absolutely. You know, most people in, in our concept, right? Like we, we've got so much, I, I don't know, like again, 
I'm obviously not the person to talk to about what it means to be black, right? Blackness is not, it, it is its own oh, field, right? Like the study of, of what it means to be black is its own thing because it is so complex and so rich, right? And so we've got so much baggage in terms of mm. our desire to think about humanity mm -hmm. as black and white to have this binary, almost always to the disadvantage of people who fall into the category black. And I'm not sure, the ancient Egyptians in the New Kingdom period at least, did think of the world, they did think of human, it seems like at least, that they thought of human populations as distinctive, you know, as being, you know, as, as a place has a people, right? And that you can tell where people are from by looking at them. Right, they seem to have associated geography with human phenotypes. But it's not necessarily the case, and this is, I'm speaking purely about the New Kingdom, right? And I'm thinking about, you know, the Amarna period, um, the hymns that, that talk about God creating, the God creating humanity with its distinctive types of people, right? The people with their distinctive types of appearance. And but I, I think those boundaries were probably a lot more porous than they became in the modern world and their definitions, right? They're sort of the way people might've been characterized and whether or not they could, could cross those boundaries and the values that we ascribe to boundaries, right? So there's always been, you know, in, in recent human memory, this sort of equation of black with less than, you know, sort of one of the great crimes of modern humanity is, you know, making that that compartment for humanity, making these two, like there's a line. And if you fall on the side of it that is black, then it's automatically less than. And this is how we've gotten a lot of really bad ideas about history, like the, the pharaonic race that Petrie imagined must have peopled ancient Egypt and created its civilization, right? This idea that there's a dividing line and everything that falls on the black side of it must be less than, and you have to come up with some explanation <laughs> If anybody from that side of the line does anything amazing, right? Crazy. You know, to me at least, from my from where I sit, that is baggage that it's really hard to shed. Because in the ancient world, right, it, it, that line isn't impermeable, at least as far as we can tell. Mm. And the values that we associate with it might not be the same that they do, right? The values that hopefully that we're shedding obviously, right? Like our aspiration as humanity is to get away from that kind of backwards thinking. Right. You know, and I don't think that there's a lot of evidence that in the ancient world, those categories were as absolute or those values were the same that, that we've ascribed to it. Mm. You know, the ancient Egyptians, and, and as you, you know, you and your, your colleagues have, you know, rightly observed, right? And, and noted the ancient Egyptians definitely recognized that they weren't identical physically they didn't they weren't like people from farther south and west in africa right they thought of themselves apparently they represented themselves in art as distinctive but whether or not that automatically meant that no one from those populations could come and live in egypt could adopt egyptian practices could marry an egyptian could become part of egyptian civilization you know a respectable part of egyptian society you know i think that's a whole nother question Okay. Yes. Real quick, Garfield. That's interesting. I, I didn't even want to put you on that path to have to even put you in that situation. What I will tell you is our study group, the pseudo killers, we, we, we fight against pseudo scientific ideas. And so basically we recognize that race is a socially constructed, a social construct. And we recognize that, 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 that our values that we place on skin color was it the same values that the ancient world would have placed on skin color? That's just based off our limited research, our reading the experts, and so we understand that. So it's an anachronism to place our ideas and what happened through uh, enslavement to these period colonization to put that on an ancient race. We do not, we do not make those connections. I just wanted to let you know our feelings on that subject. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. And I appreciate it. Because I, again, I don't want to step over the line here. I don't want to come into a conversation that I don't belong in, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I know what yeah. it is. That's why you know, I, I want to make sure I'm being respectful of you all and your 
Absolutely. That's important. That That's important for, for people, period, to respect each other's boundaries and comfortability. You know, so if, I, if, I'm, if I'm going over the, any lines that you guys would prefer we not cross in this conversation, please, you know, tell me and step me back. I'm comfortable in my blackness. Oh, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> you know, you know but again, for, for me, somebody who looks like me to come in here and talk to, talk about what it means to be black you know i'm okay if you guys would prefer that me not even be part of that space because that's something that i I got you like you know what i mean i want to be respectful of you all absolutely scientific for me that's respecting me if you keep it egyptology and what the field see and what the science is saying Mm -hmm. that's respecting the hard work i put in and trying to understand it you know science is a study of nature and so Mm -hmm. so far the best tools man have created man and women have created is science which is the study of nature so we're all in on that and (laughs) and i'm and i'm black and i'm proud just uh, just for the record (laughs) (laughs) we all are uh let me let me ask you this um dr bryson do you um do you see egyptians as a collective unit when they were being named as far as whenever they use the term kemet do you see it as a collective name for the culture, meaning where the, the Desharet is and where Kemet is as far as the land space of Egypt? Do you see the equivalency of Kemet being the same as Egypt today as far as geography is concerned? More or less. So when the ancient Egyptians talked about Kemet, they were talking about the part of they were talking about the world that they lived in. They were talking about the land that they farmed, right? Because black land is the fertile black alluvial soil of the Nile. And it stretches from roughly, right? Again, very roughly the border between modern Egypt and Sudan. And that border is, it moves a lot mm-hmm. because it's a continuum. Right. right? Like Nasser right. didn't exist then, but we have the Nile cataracts that serve as kind of geographical boundary markers you know, but people could cross them. And there was a lot of exchange over that line in various periods of Egyptian history. But yeah, so very roughly from the Mediterranean to the cataract region of the Nile and what is arable, what is farmable is the black land and what is not is desert, right? The red land, the desert. And so the desert on either side to the extent that the Egyptians traveled into it, right? They mined in the Eastern desert for gold. They, you know, Across the Western Desert to interact, where they had interactions across the Western Desert in the, the sort of ring of oases, right, that allowed them to trade and interact with people in, you know, Western North Africa um, and to travel farther south into the southern parts of Africa, as far south as they could permeate, right, to, to trade, right, to find things to, to get luxury goods like gold and ivory, um, you know, right, prisoners of war, right, people were, were forced to labor in, in trafficked in the ancient world the same way as they were not, again, I say the same way, mm-hmm. you know, human trafficking is an, an eternal human problem, right, it's been going on through war and exchange for millennia, right, so there was trade, there was um, conflict, um, but basically, right, the Egyptians seem to have seen Kemet as what is now Egypt, you know, it's it's the same, roughly the same boundaries, the same borders, right? With the oases to the far west, the Red Sea on the east, and Mediterranean on the north, and the cataracts of the Nile on the south. All right. Cool. All right. Um, you have a question, Ankh? Uh, uh, back on the Kim. I, um, so, uh, for me, the Kim would help represent entire Egypt. To his geographical region in Africa, the, the black soil and high, high, you know, high promoted uh, growth vegetation. So, would it? Could, could you also apply it? Have you heard it being applied to like? I've heard people say the black, the black town, the black people of Kemet, all kinds of stuff. What? And, and your and and your reading of it and what your understanding. Uh, what would you lead to more? Would it be, you know, dealing with the skin color or dealing with the soil? Which is more probable? Just curious. When the Egypt, if the Egyptians called themselves the people of Kemet, right? They would call themselves literally, they wouldn't call themselves the Kems, right? <laughs> right? They would call themselves the people of Kemet. Okay. 
you know, Kemet is the place, the land, with its dark color, right? The word Kem is, it means dark or black in color, right? So Kem is also darkness. Um, you know, things can be described as Kem, meaning black in color, right? A better translation of Kemet is the black land. The, the thing which is black, which is the land, right? It's a, a, okay. It has a T yeah. on the end, which makes it a, a you know, an, a noun, right? But it's, it's basically meaning color. The color black is, um, you know, it's the black thing, the black land. And they also call Egypt Tom Mary, the, the beloved land. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, but they are the people of the black land when they spoke about themselves. Okay. All right. Let me let me let me do a follow up to that real carefully. So when they call themselves the beloved land, what time period, if you if you could remember, did they start using that term, Tom Mary? I when don't. I could not tell you when the term Tom Mary okay. comes into common use. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head. All right. No problem. So wait, wait one more thing. So a lot of times, us as novice are actually looking for direct evidence, like. A dictionary in ancient times that says this means the black land based off the soil. So how do Egyptologists come to associate the word Kemet with the black soil without direct evidence? How was that worked out? We have to use a combination of what we know about how the Egyptian language forms words with the context in which we see those words used. So in ancient Egypt, what we would call an adjective, right? Like a word that is used as a descriptor of something else. Um, right, the, the, it, so words in ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptian language have roots. And then they have endings that go on those roots to change the type of word that it is. It's kind of like how you add ing to a, a verb in English to make it describe that thing as a concept, right? So I run right? But I, I'm into running, right? The ing goes on the end of the word run to make it the concept of running, among other things, right? Ings can do other things. And in ancient Egypt, the root for the concept of darkness, blackness as a color is chem, just the k and the m. And whatever vowels, uh, and again, because ancient Egyptians, the ancient Egyptian language doesn't write its vowels. We can't, without being very good linguists and doing a lot of careful reconstruction. And there are scholars who do that. I'm not one of them. We can't say exactly what the vowel morphology would have been like, but, but the K and the M are the basic root word, the idea. And then you have to think, you have to look at the, how you're using it, right? So if you add an ancient Egyptian, if you take an adjective and you add a feminine ending, the dot T to it, you get a substantive, you get like, um, a thing that has that quality, right? Or you get the quality itself, right? So like, um, you know, if you wanted to talk, if you wanted to say um, the darkness, you could say Kemet, right? With a T on the end, depending again on how you're conceptualizing it, it becomes a thing, right? It's a feminine ending, right? So a dark, anything is, is the substance of use of an adjective. So taking an adjective and using it as a noun to either be darkness or the dark thing. And, right, land is a thing, you know, you put in a country, right, you know, can be conceived of as a feminine thing, I suppose. And it happens in a lot of different languages, mm -hmm. right? You know, Mother Russia, I guess, is an analogy maybe, okay. right? So you add that T on the end and then use the word chem, chemet to describe Right. If you're so like you'll hear the, you, the ancient Egyptians in a sentence talk about, right, I am from Kemet, right? I am from this dark is darkness, this this thing that is dark, and it is where I am from. We look at that and go, dark, a place, a thing that you can be from, right? A place, a homeland. Right? Or I travel to Kemet. I travel to the dark feminine thing. And the inference becomes that that is the name of the place and that it's somehow linked with darkness, right? And it's clear that the Egyptians thought of, right? They, 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 they saw with their eyes that black alluvial soil, right? And the same, same holds for desher, right? The word desher means red. 
right? So you put the T on the end, you use it as a noun, the, the redness, the red thing. As, and, and you hear it described as a place that people go to or go from, or that's next to, that lies next to the black, right? And so you build this concept of, okay, well, we have a red and a black, and then we use our eyes and see that, right, the desert is red. And the, I mean, you can literally, in Egypt today, you can stand with one foot, you know, ankle deep in black farming soil and you know, and the other foot in dusty red desert soil, right? Oh, so that's why they say it's the soil. Not because the word is there, but using common sense based on the land and what it's what you're pointing directly to. And other, you know, sort of references in ancient Egypt, right, to, you know, darkness and black, right? So there's, you know, it's, you know, it's it's clear, right, that they're contrasting black and red. It's clear that they're talking about this in terms of place and, and the qualities of the soil, right? You know, and, and we can use our own sort of what we can see about the land and what we can reconstruct about, you know, it still looked roughly the same, right? right. The Nile has right. stopped flooding. Right, right. For right. what that's right. worth, right? But, you know, there are still, I, I met, I, uh, you know, someone that I, you know, was very fortunate to call a friend was a child when the Nile still flooded. And he told me, right, about going around and, you know, he took me around his village. Like, that used to be under the water. That used to be not, right? Like, in, in, you would have this dark mud when the floodwaters receded, right? So when we use the term talking about the land, is it is it would I be crazy to say although Desheret is the red land, would they also call the red land Kemet? Or it doesn't that doesn't name is not used for, for, for because when we talk about Egypt today, it includes Desheret and it includes Kemet. So I'm trying right. to figure out so Kemet would be that area where the Nile floods over and produce this kind of soil that they use for farming. And I think by extension, right? So if by extension, by analogy, by stretching that concept, Kemet is the entirety of whatever territory the kings of Egypt controlled and whatever territory is inhabited by Egyptian people. Mm. Mm, I, like right. that. I like that. I like that. So I really appreciate that 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 that, that um, language or linguistic lesson about. <laughs> and again, this is my understanding, right? Like I I am I'm not a linguist. I'm an, I'm an art historian by training, but I was very lucky to have some very good education in the Egyptian language and in language in general. And that's my understanding. Um. Okay. So. Um. You know, and I think probably it's, I hope it's one that would make sense to, to other Egyptologists. They would look at me and go, I think you've gotten rusty here. I think you're crazy or you missed something. I, I, I think that's one that would probably resonate with, with most Egyptologists. It, um, as far as what you um, in your lifetime, reading the text and so forth, have you seen Kemet having other meanings? The word Kemet itself has, having other meanings in other cases? The word Kem. Mm -hmm. Or as an ad, like if you if you were talking if you were talking about something that is grammatically feminine, mm -hmm. and you needed to call so like because English doesn't have this right we don't have grammatical genders like uh, like in so in Arabic right a cup is kubeya right it's feminine it has the the a sound on the end of it and so if you want to call it a blue cup you'd have to call it blue with a feminine ending you know so. If you, the word Kemet could mean a black female thing. And the word Kem could mean a black male thing, right? So if you wanted to say, I'm trying to think of a, a so like a house in ancient Egypt is grammatically masculine, it's a pair. And so it, like a pair Kem would be a black house. You could, you would use the word Kem the same way we use the word black in English as an adjective to describe something that's dark in color. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, you did a great job of explaining uh, without like direct because a lot of times uh, novice such as myself, we we're, we're looking for like a dictionary or something of that manner. And, you know, based off my study, I understand that you could find a pinky bone of a hominid and reconstruct the whole body. And I just like the way you really explained it. That was very thorough. The way you explained how without direct evidence that you can come reach the conclusion that it makes more sense for it to be the black soil. There's a lot of evidence there for that. And so I really appreciate your answer and the way you constructed that. Very of course, helpful. And, and, 
And I would encourage you to always think, if you, even if you, even if we found an ancient Egyptian dictionary, because the ancient Egyptians did take an interest in their own language and they did study it and they did think about it. And if we ever found an ancient Egyptian dictionary that had the word Kemet in it and it's defined as Egypt, yeah. you still have to think, how did we get that definition? It's like modern dictionaries of ancient Egyptian. Like if you take your, your you know, Egyptian vegetable, you know, the, the sort of classic dictionary of Egyptian language, and you look at it and you think, how did we, how did we figure out this word goes with this def def definition in this dictionary? A lot of times you'd find stories like that. People have to do research. They have to think about how a word is used, what its root might be. They have to look at other languages that are related to Egyptian for analogies. Like how is that, you know, and like you're like Coptic, right? For instance, how does that word get transmitted into Coptic? How is the same phonetic root used in a period when we can be much more certain about how it was used because we have much more written language, we have translations, right? How do we, how do we get that definition, right? Dictionaries don't, dictionaries aren't handed down by God. They're created by people based on their understanding of their own language and, and their research into how those, these words came to be and how they came to be used the way we use them at any given period. So even if you found an ancient Egyptian dictionary, much less you're looking at a modern Egyptian or Coptic dictionary. Interesting. You have to ask yourself, okay, well, how did we get there? You know, and I think it's very much, and I, I noticed, right, that you're, you're, some of your some of the the people that you were speaking with in an earlier interview actually had a crumbs coptic dictionary or um and i think that's awesome right that's amazing right like i think it's very important that i not underestimate the amount of research and the amount of effort that you all have put into this topic appreciate that you know it's very clear that you all are doing your homework that you know what the resources are but i would caution you and again i think this is something that even scholars, right, even people who are professional scholars, you know, we always have to constantly check ourselves and say, okay, this is what my authoritative source says. Well, why is that? Why do I consider that source authoritative? And what is the basis for what that source says? And then am I interpreting it correctly? Am I understanding it right? Right. Right. So there are all these different layers that you have to think about whenever you approach something. And, and in the interest of time, we look something up in a dictionary and because we know that dictionary is a good dictionary, we know the scholars who compiled and edited it are good, we go with it. But there are times when it's it, even the most authoritative scholarly source, it's worth thinking about how they got there. Uh. Because that can tell us how to use that information. It can help us think about how to use it and how to expand on it, how to go from there, if that makes sense. Okay. I got a um a question um regarding um modern day Egyptians. Would you consider the modern day Egyptians closely related to the ancient Egyptians as far as that is a real tricky one for me because there's okay. two different levels on which you have to answer that just as you guys just said about race, quote unquote, is a social construct. Mm -hmm. So there's population genetics, right? You have to ask yourself. What are what is the descent, right? The sort of physical genetic descent. And then you have to ask yourself, what does ancient Egypt mean to the modern people of Egypt? And I would suggest, sure, do you guys have you guys ever spoken with an Egyptian Egyptologist? We need uh, one. No, we definitely that's in the works. That's definitely yeah, we need one. Do you have you got one? Got one for I, you? I will see, I can ask around and see if there's anybody that would be interested in talking with you guys about the like how modern Egyptians, and again, there's gonna be a lot of diversity even there because Egypt Absolutely. is not monolithic, right? Absolutely. Even modern Egypt is very diverse. Mm -hmm. Like I speak a little bit of Arabic, but I can't understand somebody from Alexandria speaking Arabic. Okay. Right? Modern Egypt has, the, the la Arabic language has dialects, people's culture differs from region to region, even within modern Egypt, which you can, to be clear, right, you can fly from Cairo to Luxor in an hour. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of difference in people's experience and their their values and their thoughts and, and, and how they live their lives. And so I would, I would love to have a whole separate conversation about that. You know, my, even the people I've talked to, some modern Egyptians are like, ancient Egypt, huh? 
you know, just because it's not something they think about much. And some are like, yes, I'm very proud of my Egyptian ancestry. And I see myself as a direct descendant of the pharaonic Egyptians. And I think that that's an important part of my identity. So like, you know, I wouldn't even hazard a statement there, except to say that genetically <laughs> speaking, I don't think we have very good evidence at this point yet. No, 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 no consensus on, on the genetic evidence as right. That that's real. And matter of fact, I kind I read that that statement right there in the book titled Ancient Egypt Society Challenging Assumptions Exploring Approaches. And I read the chapter by Samaka uh, Keita. Man, she, Gigi going to mess me up if I mispronounce Samar that. Samaka Keita. Samaka Keita. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and he talks about that. So um, just on my limited uh, um, understanding of populations and stuff, I do recognize that no population is frozen. So, so you would never expect the ancient Egyptians from 2500 BCE to be the exact same population in 2024. It just wouldn't make sense. Even in 30 BCE, you wouldn't expect it Absolutely. to be the same population. You and you wouldn't, and to be clear, right? You wouldn't expect the Egyptian population of 2500 BCE and the Egyptian population of 1500 BCE to be the same either. There are yeah. moments in history when there are mass population movements. Absolutely. And there are sort of punctuation moments, right? When populations do experience abrupt genetic change or culture change or both, relatively abrupt, right? You know, and like, like when you think about ancient Egypt in you know, the, the Middle Bronze Age, right? There's a period when there is you know, an influx of, of people from the Levant, from modern day Israel, Palestine, Syria, Syria, Israel, Palestine coming into Egypt over time, right? And they do establish a relatively homogeneous community or communities in Northern Egypt, right? These are the Hyksos, uh -huh. right? So there's presumably genetic exchange, there's <laughs> cultural exchange, right? And a lot of it's one direction. It's coming from the Levant into Egypt and bringing in whatever the snapshot of the Levant at that moment genetically and culturally is and, and sort of gives it an infusion into Northern Egypt at least. And because Egypt, there's is you know the boundaries are porous. There's going to be some diffusion, you know, into other parts of Egypt. But there's those people are also taking bits of what it is to be Egyptian and moving back with it. Right there, Egyptians living in the Levant, right? No, so, about. right. And as to whether some of those Egyptians might not originally have been, you know, have ancestors in sub-Saharan or you know, sub-Saharan, right? But southern and western parts of Africa, certainly southern and eastern parts of Africa, right? The Horn of Africa or the deserts to the east and west. You know, it's, you know it's, it's really hard to find the right evidence. Yeah, it's funny you brought up the hippos. I recently interviewed um, Dr. Manfred Bittak, right? And um, he deals with the whole avaris, the homogenous culture. He and is. That, he, he is, is the study. Of, I mean, he is the person for you to talk to. I mean, that. Yeah, he's the guy. He went. He went real deep. Um, let me ask you this: just to change topic, we're gonna get back to um, to the whole Kemet word and all that stuff, but. When you look at something that we traditionally grew up in in a Judo Christian society about the Exodus and the religious beliefs and all that stuff, how do you look at, at the um, the Exodus in the Bible? Do you look at it as um, as an Egyptologist, not as as you know? I don't know what you believe or whatever. I don't know you know, know where you are in that space, but as an Egyptologist, how do you look at the actual Exodus? I look at it as a myth that is that serves the function of explaining the importance of Egypt and its culture to a, a group of people who have their roots at any given period in modern day Israel, Palestine. Understood. Yeah. I, so wait, I mean, the way you explain that is gonna fly over people's heads. I, I promise you it's gonna fly. I heard what you said. Can I explain what I thought I heard you say? Sure, what absolutely. I, what I thought you said was that Egypt was such an influence on the ancient world during these time periods that people, whether they've been there or not, would actually incorporate them into their myth to kind of give them some sway or give them some validity. Now, I just added that to that, but basically, I'm thinking that's what you said. I think that's a really, really good way of paraphrasing it. I think because, right, Egypt and the, the group of people, right, who, from whose history, culture, religion, Judaism emerges, they're, they're so intimately connected for so long, 
right? There's, and people can have very deep memories, right? Groups of people can have like, you know, I mean, like just so like for me, right? The great depression, I didn't live through it. My mother didn't live through it, but it's, I, I, you can see how messy my house is, right? Like I still blame the fact that I'm kind of a pack rat. (laughs) (laughs) My my grandmother, right? My grandparents grew up in the great depression. Right. Lives very, a very long time. People don't forget as fast as we think they do. Right. Traumas, you know, like my dad's a Vietnam veteran. You know, I feel like sometimes there are things about his past, his trauma that somehow get passed on to me. Right. Or the great depression for my grandparents. Right. Like the past, it even affects the way your genes express the experiences that your parents and grandparents had. Like the past doesn't die as fast as we think it does. So, you know, I don't want to say that the Exodus story does not preserve real historical memories and events. You know, and and I'm talking here not about, right, actual efforts to preserve history, right? People writing things down or passing it down in an oral historical fashion that's intentional, right? I don't think that just because, right, the Exodus supposedly happens in, you know, either 1450 or 1250 BCE, Right. And the people who are writing down the story of the Exodus are living a thousand years later or, you know, a few hundred years later. Depend- and again, all of this depends on how you reconstruct these timelines. I don't think that means there's nothing there. Right. But I think that there's more to it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think that the Exodus is a myth because there is no, to be very clear, there is no evidence for the Exodus. As an Egyptologist, if somebody were to tell me that an Exodus of over a million people from Egypt happened in either 1450 or 1250 BC, I would go, what? <laughs> or, or if someone were to say there was a population of mono, there was a single tribe that believed in a monotheistic Canaanite religion, right? Living in Egypt with a very distinct identity, right? The thought, a group of people who thought of themselves as the sons of Israel. I would be very surprised. I don't think, like there's no evidence for any of that. But if you told me that a group of people who had longstanding cultural and historical ties to Egypt Mm -hmm. were expressing that by telling this story, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It makes a lot of sense. Real real quick, Garfield, real quick, real quick. So like African-Americans come from Africa, but African-Americans were not in Africa, but we have a genetic memory of our ancestors being there being traumatized, enslaved, and brought to America. So it could have been that the ancestors that were later on become Israelites or Hebrews, their ancestors, not as Hebrews, right? Not as Israelites, were actually in Egypt. A few of them. Mm-hmm. Well, Asiatic tribes were later on form different things. Africans were later on form African-Americans based off certain you know, experiences. <laughs> 